Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Psalms 15, Psalms 24. It's casual day today. I'm getting away with wearing a casual jersey. Right? I talked to Chad and Amy, and they say during the playoffs, everybody in their church comes in the local colors, whatever they, you know. The, yeah. What is it? The fossils? No. The, the, Louisiana, no, Louisiana, LSU, Tigers. Yes. Psalms 15 and Psalms 24. We are going to baptize today. We're going to baptize Mark in Jesus' name today. Yes. 
questions about your faith in God, understand you're probably not looking at the God that created everything. Amen. I like it. When I'm in trouble, I can look to the hills and yeah. from with my help. And then it defines for us where that help is going to come from. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. You ever thought your problems were too great for God to handle? Just go back to that verse and, and look at it. It says, hey, the one who is helping me created everything. Right. My little problems can't mean a whole lot to him. That's right. Well, I can get the preaching. I'm yeah. going really quiet here right now. Yeah. <laughs> my little addictions, my little habits, my little right. problems, my, the things in my life, my circumstances, yeah. all of those relational things that we have so much trouble with, all of those things. Right. Listen, it's the God that created everything that's going to help us. Right. I can't my problems. Excited about God for that. For he had founded it upon the skis, established it upon the floods. And then it asks the same question again. Who shall ascend into the hill of God or who shall stand? And the word stand is again a permanent word. It means to stay there. It means that this is a place that you are going to be established. I'm going to be established in God's kingdom. Anybody else want to be established with me? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Defines who it should, who will do that. He that hath clean hands right. and a pure heart, right. who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And then it goes on to say, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is, referring back to this, the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, say love. Lift up your hands, or pardon me, your heads. O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is King of glory. He is the King of glory. Say law. The word say law means to pause and consider this. Now, just before I get into preaching here today for just a little bit, I want you to know that I desire so very much that the Word of God would fall on good ground. Amen. What you listen, how you listen, how you hear is going to depend on whether the Word of God falls on good ground. Good ground is your heart and your soul. So let's pray right now and ask God to prepare our hearts to receive His Word, shall we? Lord, we love you so much. I thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for your precious touch in our life. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. God, you know that for most of my life, Jesus, before I came to know you, I always desired that there would be something miraculous that I would be able to see. Something miraculous that would touch me and change me. And God, when you came into my life at the age of 27, Lord, and you changed so much that was about me, God, you made me to become a new creation, a new creature in you. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah. Yeah. And Lord, I thank you for that miracle. Thank you for the miracle of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. The miracle of baptism, yeah. whereby I was cleansed from all of my sin. They were washed away once and for all. I thank you, Jesus, for that. And Lord, today, today as I preach, I pray, God, that each and every heart that is here will prepare themselves right now to receive your word, that your word may become a part of their lives and change them in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. And I'll let you be seated. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to have everybody here. For the, I, know, I don't know if it was announced or not or whether I missed it. We are having a barbecue meal after church today. Amen. And uh, Father's Day, and uh, we, in honor of our fathers, the fathers get out there and barbecue some food. And uh, so that's a good example, you know. Fathers should be servants. Oh boy. Amen. I heard a few people. So let's just talk about fathers for a little bit before I get my message. How many of you realize what a father should be? What is the one main and most important thing that a, that a father should do for his family? Provide for God. Provide for them would be right at the top of most definitions, right? 
It's a father's job to provide for his family. But the greatest provision that you can give to your family is a godly wife. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. I just don't understand people that would live for God for a time and then give up on living for God. That are men and leaders and fathers and husbands. I just don't quite understand that. That you would not set an example, that you would not live for God well enough, that your family, your wife, and your children wouldn't have somebody to say, hey, I want to pattern my life after that man who knew how to live properly. Amen. I pray that the men in this church will learn to live for God effectively and well and be strong in God, be prayers, readers of the word, be diligent in every aspect of their living for God. Amen. And all the men said amen. amen. I noticed something when I said amen for a prayer on Thursday morning that I was almost alone in that. So uh, all the men say amen. I'm going to be at prayer on Thursday morning. Amen. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we're getting closer. Man, we're going to win this sooner or later. Amen. So you notice in this passage of scripture, both of them talk about ascending up into God's tabernacle or God's holy hill or God's place, right? So we've got to go back, and in order to understand this, we have to go back and just look at it from David's perspective, because it was David that wrote this. So when David looked at God's holy hill, originally Zion, or God's hill, was, was one of the smaller hills in Jerusalem. But when David did something very unusual when he brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he, he, when he set it up onto Mount Moriah, which is what they call Zion right now, it's, it's the hill in Jerusalem where they built, eventually built the permanent tabernacle, and he set up a tent there. And in that tent, he put the Ark of the Covenant, and he put all the fixtures that were originally in that tent that Moses had made that traveled through the wilderness. And I, I look at this, and, and I know the scripture says that this is the only temple that God himself is going to rebuild. Didn't say that he was going to rebuild Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. Did not say that he was going to rebuild Solomon's temple, which was elaborate and fine and wonderful. But he did say, God did say he was going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which all it was was a tent. Everything was wide open inside the tent. The Ark of the Covenant was there for everybody to see. There was worship and praise in that place continuously. And, uh, and that's what David is talking about. Now, how many know there's types and shadows in the Old Testament? Yeah. Understand something. That in the Old Testament, when it talks about the hill of Zion, it talks about the household of God or the temple of God, it's actually referring, when it talks about Zion, it is referring to God's church in the future. This is the tabernacle that God rebuilt. Look around you. You're all part of that tabernacle. You're the church of the living God. When God brought you into that church, he was constructing that tabernacle that David built way back then, reconstructing it in the image that God wanted it to be reconstructed in. There is to be permanent worship in God's temple and tabernacle. Right. So when David asks the question, he's not just talking about that, that temple because it was impossible for somebody to live there continuously. He's talking about prophecy. He's talking about the church. And he's asking the question, who is going to be able to ascend up to that place where God's presence is always, where there is going to be worship and praise always happening in that place, where you are going to be able to enter in and, and there's going to be no division, there's going to be no obstruction, there's not going to be any curtain in the way, there's going to be nothing between you and the presence of God. Isn't that an awesome place to be? Amen. Now, I've noticed in my life, I've noticed in prayer times, and I've noticed when I've come here to worship God, that, that I can come and I can lift up my hands and begin to worship God, and I can feel the presence of God just like that. In my heart and my mind are right. I can feel the presence of something supernatural and great and wonderful that's beyond anything that I experienced before I came to God. I can feel that. There's nothing to stop me from right now entering into the presence of God. There's nothing to stop you right now from entering into the presence of God. Right. Except what may be in your heart. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> because those things have gotten, gotten out of us in order that we can enter in. So when, when David's talking about this in these two psalms, he's talking about the desire that he had that, that he wanted to find 
find a place where he didn't have to walk into the tabernacle and leave. He wanted to find a place where he'd be able to come into the presence of God and it would be with him all the time, not just in that one place on top of that hill. Right. And when he looks forward, and when we look forward to where we are right now, and what Terry taught this morning in the adult lesson, boy, I'll tell you something. We can, we can walk in the presence of God yes. all the time. Yeah. We, can, we can come in and when we enter in and worship or when I get into a place of prayer and we can come in and we can feel that presence of God just like that. But I'll tell you something. I can leave this sanctuary today and walk out those back doors out there and I know for a fact that I can take the presence of God with me and I don't have to leave it because God can be with me every moment of every day. Amen. He can be with me when I go to work. He can be with me when I, I go to be entertained or go to do something recreational. God can be with me in my home. He can be with me wherever I go. He can be with me when I go shopping. He can be with me when I'm showing houses to sell. God can be with me every moment of every day and every time if I will allow him. Amen. If I will allow him to be a part of my life. If I will walk in the Holy Ghost and walk in the Spirit of God, as Terry was talking about this morning, then I can have God with me and I can dwell. It won't be a temporary place where I'm in and out and in and out and in and out. I feel God and then I don't feel God and I feel God and I don't feel God. And yes, he's here and now he's not here. And, and now I feel his touch so close and, and then we go out and we don't feel anything. But there is a place that we can go where we can have him with us all the time. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. David longed for it. And then he, by inspiration of God, because all scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah. And then by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he writes down some, some prerequisites for this to be in our life. And you're going to notice some things about God, that there are promises. The promise of the Holy Ghost is, is the requirements that you have to have before that is you have to repent of your sins. You have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. Then God promises you that he will put his spirit inside of you. And so you, we find that this is, there are conditional covenants in the Bible. And so it is with this dwelling in a place where God is with us all the time. The first thing that he says is we must walk uprightly. Right. Amplified says that we must walk and live our lives blamelessly. Walk right. Yeah. Amen. Walk so that people are going to know that you're living for God. If your language says that, that, that you're just part of this world and, and you talk just the same way everybody else does, I want you to know there's, there's something right. wrong with your life. Your right. life should reflect the change that God made in you. It should reflect the fact that God has made a difference in your life. Walk according to the things that God has asked you to do. Walk according to his word. Seeing that these things, uh, talking about the end of the world, all must come to pass. What manner of person ought we to be in all manner of conversation? How should we live our lives? Walk uprightly. Walk and live blamelessly. Amen. Number two, he who works rightness and justice. It seems like there is so much that is unjust that goes on around us. Just open up the paper and you see a lot of different things. I don't know what is just about burning people's cars. Yeah, I don't know what's just about people standing there trying to protect property and other people are kicking them and beating them. I don't know what's just about stuff like that. But I know it is just to be kind and loving and caring. And it's just also that those that would do such things would receive retribution for what they do. Right. I know that's justice. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Number three is so vitally important, and I want to stop here for just a minute. No, I'll come back to number three. Uh, jump down to number four. It doesn't slander. doesn't do evil to his neighbors. In other words, we should be good to those. Uh, when Jesus talked about those that were his neighbors or those that should be our neighbors, it's whoever we meet. Who was neighbor to the Samaritan on the side of the road? Well, all of them had the opportunity to do so. But it was only the one that, or not the Samaritan, but the fellow that was in the ditch. It was only the Samaritan that stopped and did good to him. So who was neighbor to him? The one that stopped. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, uh, who doesn't believe a reproach or a negative report of his neighbor? Have you ever listened to gossip and slander? Yeah. Have you ever passed it on? Why do we pass it on without getting confirmation? 
It's almost like there's something, there's something inside of us that wants to believe the worst of everybody. And not only do we want to believe the worst, there's something inside of us that wants everybody else to know about it. And it's just part of our carnal nature, isn't it, Terry? We want to do that. Not yours. That's what he taught on this morning, just in case you're thinking that. I'm thinking that you know. So no slander, no gossip. These are the people that will be able to remain in God's presence. Uh, those that will look at a vile person and consider him to be contemned, not condemned, contemned, but will honor them that fear God. The word fear God in the Amplified says those who reverence and worship God. So can I tell you that these two things are opposite? They're opposites. This is the person that will remain with God. When you see a vile person, you're not going to honor that person in what they're doing. Right. That makes sense to you? Yeah. I'm not going to honor people that are living in sin. I'm not going to honor people that are doing the wrong thing. I'm not going to honor, give them honor for what they're doing. I'll be kind, but the best thing that I can do for them, tell them about Jesus Christ. Tell them that they need their sins washed away. Tell them that they need to find a place to repent. The best thing I can do for people if I love them and care for them is to tell them that Jesus died for their sins, that he shed his blood on the cross, that if they will apply that blood in their lives, their sins can be washed away, and they can be clean of those sins, and clean and free of the habits that have gotten a hold of their lives, and that they can have liberty in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. But to honor them and say, oh, you're doing so good, when they're living in sin, uh-uh. That's right. I'm not going to do that. But I will honor those that are around me today that have given their lives to fearing God. That means to worship in God. That means to giving Him praise. Listen, somebody asked me about one of you, I'm going to tell them they're the greatest people on the face of the earth. They have decided that, that uh, living the way this world wants them to live is not... Listen, those of you that want to live the way this world wants you to live are so weak and pathetic. It takes a man or a woman of strength and character to say, hey, I'm going to walk in a different direction than what everybody else wants me to. Right. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Well, I'm almost getting wound up here already. Good preaching. Amen. 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 Now, the other part talks about not uh, not charging interest. You know what usury is interest, right? Right. Excessive interest. Can I can I talk about the, the principle of what this is talking about rather than the specific? Would that be okay? Because basically usury is charging excessive enough interest that you are making gain over somebody else being lessened. Does that make sense? Now, almost always in our, our workplace today and in our world today, if you advance yourself in a company or an organization or even personally or socially, it's almost always at the expense of somebody else. Yeah. Had somebody say something about me one time talking about... Um, Something negative, I won't say what it was. And I went up to them because I know what scripture says. And I said, you know what? I believe and honestly feel within my heart that the only reason you would say something like that about me that's not true is to try and elevate yourself at my expense. Yeah. And you want to know something? It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Our worldly way of dealing with things is I'm going to you ever seen two people fighting over something, yeah. arguing over something? Almost always, and don't get me wrong on this, I'm going to be very careful on how I say this. Even in God's church sometimes, the spirit comes in. Yeah. That in order to advance what you think in the church, that you will talk ill of somebody else. You want to know something? That's just not right. We never want to put ourselves in the position where we're trying to advance our own efforts, our own... Uh, relationship, our own whatever position that you're after at the expense of somebody else. Right. So that's the principle that's involved in what he's talking about when they're talking about usury. I do not want to be rich in any area of my life if it's going to cost somebody else. Everybody say amen. Amen. Are you all awake? You're all good? Okay. And then of course in the second Psalms it says that he will not lift himself up in vanity. Now let's go back to number three. I want to just talk about this for just a little bit. Is honest, 
first of all, in his heart and what he says. These are the people that will remain. You know what the hardest thing for us to do, Colin, is? It's to look ourselves in the mirror and know every single weakness is that is in you or is in me. And I'm sitting there looking at it and be honest enough to say, you know what, these right. things are really wrong. Right. Yeah. Right. You know what the easiest thing to depress to do is? To justify it. Yeah. Well, everybody else is doing it. Yeah. You know, people around me are doing it. Yeah. yeah. Does that mean you should? Yeah, no. You know, should we do something because, well, if a thousand people are wrong, are we going to do wrong because a thousand people around us are doing wrong, or should we do right? Yeah. Everybody said amen. 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 So being honest enough, because you see, when a person gets up in front of a church and preaches God's message, and you see things and you begin to feel conviction about things in your life, and you decide to close that off, you're not being honest with yourself. So the first aspect of being able to remain in God's presence. Remember the Bible says all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire? Yeah. You ever notice that in scripture? Yeah. It seems kind of harsh to me. Because all of us have lied. It. If you haven't lied in your life, I want you to put your hand right now because I want to meet you afterwards. I'd like to know you just a little bit better because maybe that will rub off on me. Because I, I used to pride myself on being able to lie well. Yeah. To be able to look people straight in the eye and tell them a falsehood. But you know what? The first thing that we need to be is honest about ourselves. Stop deceiving yourself. If you're doing things that are sinful, you're not going to get away with it. That's right. You will not get away with it. God sees everything. So why, why bother even trying to hide it? When you come before God, just say, God, I'm a sinner. Oh, man, that was the greatest day in my life. When I realized that when I compared myself with him and his holiness, there is nothing righteous and nothing good about me that is worth talking about. The only thing that's good and worth talking about about me right now is what Jesus yeah. has done in my life and the changes that he's made. It's not what I was before. I don't want that to be a part of my life. And you know what? When God convicts me today, I still want to come before him. I want to come to an altar say, Lord, forgive me. I want to be like you. I want to forgive the, of my sin. I want you to wash me so that I can be clean. So, his honesty in his heart and then is honest in the things that you speak about. Right. Now, I'm going to just put this to you because I know we do this. I ask people all the time, how are you doing today? Yeah. I've tried to change that. How many of you have, honestly have answered, oh, I'm doing fine and you're having the worst day in the world? Yeah. And if you haven't done that, yeah. you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing great, yeah, but no, this is one of the lousiest days I've ever had. But I'm going to tell everybody around, I don't want anybody to know that I'm struggling yeah, yeah. or having difficulty or this has been a bad day. So yeah. I'm just going to tell everybody, yeah, I'm doing fine. And you know what? I've stopped when people ask me that question. I pause for a moment yeah. Yeah. to think about, well, how really am I doing today? And I will try and define for them what's going on in my day rather than just, if my day's fine and I say it's going fine, it probably is going fine. But if I'm having difficulties about some things, yeah. well, I'm just going to stop and say, hey, you know what? There's some things that are not going so well in my day. That's right. I'd rather be honest. I'd rather be honest in the things that are in my heart. I'd rather be honest with the things that I say to others than to try and deceive. You know what happens if you lie long enough? You believe it. Have you ever found somebody like that? That would lie when it's easier to tell the truth? And not only do they lie when it's easier to tell the truth, they believe their own lies? Have you ever met someone like that? It's pretty sad, isn't it? Three types of deception. Uh, the, the Bible talks about the deception of others, the deception of self, which is really dangerous, and then the attempt to deceive God, which is kind of useless. You can't deceive God at all. That's right. Amen. So the first thing that is so vitally important, you've got to be honest. Honestly, when you come to God. When you come into church, when you come 
begin to read God's word, or you go to God in prayer, and you begin to speak to him, God is going to speak back to you. That's right. Some of what he speaks to you about is going to be great and wonderful because he's going to tell you what you can be in him. In him. Right. Some of it is going to be very difficult for you. Yeah. Because he's going to point out the things in your life that need to be changed. I don't care how long you live for God. I don't care how short a time you live for God. You're never going to reach a place where God does not speak to you about the things he wants to work on in your life. God, I want my heart to be prepared for you to speak to me. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for God to speak to you? Did you want us to pray at the beginning of the service that God would, would speak to your heart about the things you needed to change and the things you needed to correct and make different? Because God will. And he may be doing that right now. Psalms 24 says that we should have clean hands and a pure heart. Two things are involved there, the clean hands. Now, okay, how many have washed this morning? Have you showered or washed this morning? Okay, we may play some games afterwards after we have our meal together. And we may play some bocce. The bocce balls are going to get a little dirty because we're going to throw them in the dirt. But I washed already this morning. Mm -hmm. I don't need to wash again. I already did that this morning, so I never need to clean them again. But if you look at John's, where's John? Are your hands clean today, John? <laughs> John does cabinets. And he, so... For two days staining, was it? One day staining, his hands were gross. <laughs> he had black all around him, fingernails and black everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, John, you need to wash those things. If I was his wife, I certainly wouldn't want to, want to hold hands with him. <laughs> she loves him anyway. Listen, just because you got clean once, Clean again. Now, when, when it's talking about clean hands and a pure heart, it's talking about two different things. The outward part of what we do needs to be cleansed. Right. Our lives need to be right. right. If you've made a mistake and you've said something to somebody that's offensive to them, the Bible's so clear. You need to apologize. You need to get it right. right. Amen. Clean up the things that you're doing. Right. Don't just put it off to them. This is the way I've always been. I hate yeah. that saying. Yeah. People are just going to have to accept me the way that I am. No, they don't. You need to, in the Holy Ghost, change what you were. Let God help you to change so that you can be a different person the next time you come in contact. And if you have to say your story, humble yourself before them. Because God honors those that are humble and will resist the proud. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So... Clean yourself. How do we do that? How do we clean ourselves? Listen, we go out in the world, there's a lot of sin out there. Yeah. Sometimes a lot of sin in here. Yeah. We're coming in contact with sin. Things that, that, that make us, let me put it this way, filthy spiritually. Yeah. Even as Christians, we come in contact with that stuff. The Bible says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's talking to us, who are the children of God, that we can come before God and we can be cleansed and we can be clean if we will be honest and confess. And then it goes on and talks about, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to kind of explain this. This phrase to you that comes from Psalms 24. Just a little bit, okay? Just so you understand what it's talking about. When a person would come before the king back in those days, you would make your petitions of the king with your head bowed. You would ask him for something. The king would, the Bible says he's the lifter of my head, right? So that when you're ready to receive from him, your head would come up. 
and you would begin looking towards the one that is above. You ever notice this? You notice in the New Testament when, when Peter and John were on their way into the temple to pray? Ever notice that? And, and that guy that was asking for stuff, he, was, he had his head down. We know we had his head down because Peter told him to look on us, which would have meant lifting his head up. And so he's got his head down, he's asking alms, alms, at the gate, beautiful. And then Peter and John come, and you say, well, what has this got to do with the king? Because what they were receiving was from the king of glory. And whether or not Peter and John really understood all that they were doing, he says, lift up your head and look on us, because you're about to receive something. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. I'm excited. I don't know about you. But when I get the king in God's presence, and there's times that I will come in and I will bow my head and I will ask God, God, I need so many things for you to do for me. I need you to touch my children. I need you to touch my grandchildren. I need you to solve this and those that are in the church and help this one and strengthen this one. And help this one to repent. God, you've got to do these things for me. But when I'm ready to receive from God, well, I look up and I lift up my hand. And I begin to worship him and praise him. And know that there is a God that has made everything that's going to answer my prayer. And he's going to say, yeah, I'm going to touch your children right now. I'm going to keep my hand on your grandchildren. And I'm going to touch those that are in the church that you're pastor. Those that need a healing, I'm going to heal. Those that need to repent, I'm going to move on them to repent. Those that need to get closer to you, closer to him, I'm going to touch them and draw them. Well, I'm lift up my head. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. As the musicians come, and Mark gets ready for our baptismal service, part of this service, I just want to do something. I want to make it possible for you to be honest with God today. Not with me, not with anybody, not your friends or relatives or people that are around you. But just so you know today, that in all of our lives there are things that God is so working on for us to be able to change. I want you to be honest enough to say, Lord, I'm going to come to you today and I want to give that to you in repentance today. I just want to come to you and say, Lord, this is the things that I've done this week that I know that I shouldn't have. And I miss the mark, Lord. These are the things that I thought. These were the imaginations of my scripture and I know that he's been coming to church with Ray for a while and uh, thinking about this he didn't make the decision to be baptized um, just out of habit or just because it was something that needed to be done but he's given considerable thought and time to this and I know Brother Hall's given him a Bible study this last week on all that baptism is for and what it does. I do want to read to you something just before we baptize Mark. It's from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, starts in verse 20 talking about the days of Noah. It says, which sometimes, talking about those during that time, sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure or type Whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If I could just explain that to you for just a, just a moment. It's not because this water is going to wash over you and, and maybe you might be cleaner in your skin than what you were before. But it is because that you're in your heart now, your conscience and your heart have said, I'm going to live for God. I want God to be a part of my life. 
and you've decided that, that because you have said that in your heart, that God is going to do something altogether different than just getting you wet. That's right. God's going to cleanse all of those sins and all of the iniquities and everything that was in your past life. And God will no longer remember it anymore. He's just going to put that stuff away. Thank you, Jesus. And you're going to open yourself up to the yes. Holy Ghost Hallelujah. in this, Hallelujah. that God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. When you come back up out of the water, just yes. lift up your hands yes. and worship God. God can fill you just as you come out of the water. Amen. Hallelujah. So if I, you can just uh, make your way up there and sit down facing, facing that way. That's it. Carefully. We don't want to have an injury. Amen. Yeah, just sit down with your legs out that way. Amen. Just move a little closer up that way. So, and family and friends, you want to let uh, you guys want to come a little closer. I know that you would like to be able to see Mark be baptized in Jesus' name. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to pray for him right now. I'd like everybody, all of us, to just pray together. Uh, tremendous power in the Holy Ghost when we are unified in one mind and one accord. Amen. So let's just pray right now that God's just going to continue to lead Mark from this point forward. God's going to fill him with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I just love you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this decision, Lord, that Mark has made for his life. I know he has not done so lightly, Lord, but he has absolutely, Jesus, thought about this, prayed about this. God knows that it's in your word. And Lord, he's made this decision, Jesus, knowing that this is what your word says and that he wants to be obedient to it. Lord, I know that your word says, Jesus, that you will wash and that you will cleanse him of all of his sins. And God, I know the enemy will try and raise them again. But Jesus, today, Lord, as we pray, I pray, God, that you will just give Mark the strength to say, in Jesus' name, you're no longer a part of my life. But from this moment on, I'm going to be God. From this moment on... I'm going to have God's thoughts. From this moment on, I'm going to live as God would have me to live. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Strengthen him, Lord, day by day to grow in you. To be the type of a man, Lord, that you desire him to be. Jesus, I pray that you will fill him with the Holy Ghost. And God, that through that infilling of the Holy Ghost, you will give him revelation. God, that you will lead him and guide him continuously into greater truth. In Jesus' name, that you will give him liberty over sin. Freedom over the things that have afflicted him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Mark, if I can just get you your nose with one hand. And hold on to my wrist with your other hand. Mark, on the confession of your faith and in obedience to the scriptures, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jesus.